Titus, the first Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel 17. And we'll be looking, uh, we'll be reading from verse 45. First Samuel 17, 45. David said to him, you have come to fight me. This is when David was addressing Goliath. He says, you have come to fight against me with a sword, a knife, and a spear. But I have come to fight against you with the authority of the Lord Almighty. He is the God who leads Israel's army, and you have insulted him. 46. Today the Lord will make me strong to win against you. I will knock you down, and I will cut your head. Today, I will feed the birds and the wild animals with the dead bodies of the Philistine soldiers. Then everyone on the earth will know that there is a God who takes care of Israel. Let us just pause on that one. Earlier on, we see that David basically addressed Goliath. Not only did he address Goliath, he also addressed the army of the Philistines. And in my mind, I, I just say, let's pause. Um, everything about scripture and everything about Christianity, everything about God is all about relationship. David knew he had a relationship with God. He knew the authority. He did not go to fight on his own authority. He stated it there that the authority I have in Christ, the authority I have in God is what will make me victorious over you. You've got your spear, you've got your sword, but I've got my God. I've got the authority of my God. And David also spoke, he said to Goliath then that he would cut off Goliath's head. He didn't have his own sword. He only had his stones. So how was he able to speak to his future? And that's why it's important for us to know what authority we, we carry. You know, he confronted Goliath under the authority of Jehovah. Um, verse, let's open Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, just to buttress what David did. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. He says, I can do all, three, all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is, that was David's faith in God, you know. And let's, have we ever imagined, have we ever encountered people who would say to you that, you know, you've just got this insurmountable faith, irrespective of what God has done in their life, or who, irrespective of whether they're sure or not, help is coming. They say, you know what, I trust that God will come through for me, irrespective of what has been given to them despite and in spite the situation as surrounding them. Um, Job is one example in the Bible. He just had faith that God would come through for him. David is another example who just knew that God would come through for him. He did not even know how, but he just knew that God was going to come through for him. I mean, there are certain times you meet people and you say, ah, what are you doing concerning your situation? And they say, I don't know, but God is going to come through for me. Yeah. And sometimes you might so certain times people try to trick them and say, oh, but they've said this, they've said that, they've said that. And I say, yeah, I just trust God is going to come through for me. It's just like a child. Um, our children don't have to pray to God to say, oh, let daddy do this today, or let mommy do this, let mommy give. I use, for instance, a little girl of this. She just comes and says, daddy, I want milk. <laughs> she does not care how the milk is going to come, but she knows that milk is going to come when she asks for it. And that's what God is bringing us to. You know, that's the whole faith, that's the whole faith idea God is bringing us to. We are made in the image and the likeness of God. And it's all about faith. The whole thing about the Old Testament, when God decided that Israel was going to be his people, he created Israel 
and placed the Egyptians there. He decided, okay, I'm going to deliver Israel from the land of Egypt. What was that? It was all about building their faith. At a time when Israel was in the land of Egypt, they could not run from the idea that they were delivered. Even when Moses came, they said, leave us alone. They literally told Moses to leave us alone. You know what, we are fine, we are better off where we are. But Moses kept going, and eventually they were delivered. But when God delivered them from Israel, from Egypt, what was the next thing? It was all about, okay, now I've delivered you. You guys have faith in me. Now I'll give you the Ten Commandments. I will show you how to grow your faith. I will show you how to have a relationship with me. Faith journey is not only about believing God for what He will do, it's also believing that God will always come through for you, you know. And um, let's quickly look at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Because that was, I think, that was the word he gave to Moses. It says, um, Fear not, for I am with you. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will hold my righteous, my righteous right hand. Amen. You know, it is important for us to realize that um, everything we do is all about relationship. When he's saying you should, you should not fear, he's telling you that he is actually there with you. He is. There is nothing we go through that God does not see. At times, when I say to ourselves, "Oh, he didn't answer," but even if he's not answering, it's because he knows better. So we need to come to that point where we have that faith that irrespective, despite and in spite, God is God and he will come through. Amen. You know, may God get us to that level in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Romans 8, 31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That was Moses. That was the same challenge Moses had. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? That was what made him move to go and confront Pharaoh. You know? So the main points we need to realize when we're dealing with giants is we need to recognize the giants in front of us. And recognizing the giants does not necessarily mean we should be as we should be scared of them or we should be worried. We've just met where it says we should fear not, for God is with us in all things. But we need to recognize the giants. Everyone who faces giants in life faces fear. But it is overcoming that fear that is important. And giants can come in different forms. They can come in form of fear, they can come in form of addiction, they can come in form of health issues, you know. David did not rely on his personal strength. He did not rely on his knowledge of fighting bears and um, lions. But he only knew that the God who came through for him in the past. So one thing that actually helps us to conquer fear or conquer or obstacles in front of us is people's past testimonies or what God has done for us in the past. If we can only remember, someone always said, if you can think, you'll be able to think. So if we can remember what God did for us in the past, say you are trusting God. I will use my example. There was a time when I had immigration issues in this country and all the time I hear people come and give testimony and say, oh, God did it for me, God did it for that one, God did it for that. And I said, oh, if God can do it for this one, then person, then there is, um, there is a chance that he will do it for me. And they, even if he doesn't do it for me, it's his choice, you know. And God did actually do it for me. So I just want to implore us and um, ask us to always remember and when we hear people give testimonies, we need to always tap into that testimony and say, if the God who did it for this person is the same person, is the same God that will do it for us. 
God is, someone did say that God is an expert in repeated performances. So he would always exceed himself. Say he's done it for point A. And we have it in the Bible where God performed, Jesus Christ performed miracles and God performed miracles. And the next time when he performs similar miracles, he performed it even in a better and a more grander version. Let us quickly open our Bibles to Quickly open our Bibles to first, sorry, to um, Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah 41, we will stay on Isaiah 41 verse 10 for a bit, you know, and Isaiah 41 says, Fear not, for I am with you, be not dismayed. There's a reason why he said we should not be dismayed. It's when we face giants, there's a big chance that we will look at because that's what is staring us in the face. Number one, we don't see God. We don't see God, but what is going to increase our faith if we don't see God? It is his past actions towards us. It is what we have heard God say, you know, about, it's what we have heard people say about God in the past. It is what we have read in the Bible about God. So it is important that we read the scriptures. It is important that we study. Um, Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says, Study this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, for you should meditate in it day and night. That way you would, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written in it. That way you make your way prosperous and you would have good success. So our success is always tied to the word of God. It is always tied to God. But there's fight, like we always, we started on this, there's fight and in spite of the success. If we are not successful, God is God. If we are successful, God is God. He will always be God, you know? Um, I would encourage us to continue to grow our faith, even in tough times. In tough times, we have the example of Job. He lost everything. He was at the point of, even to the point of losing his wife. He lost all his children, he lost all his wealth, he lost his health, but God came through for him in the end. I don't know, it was, was it three Sundays ago, or four Sundays ago, when Pastor was giving examples of Job and Paul. And he says, Job, God's, instant reward but Paul on the other hand he was not just pastor, he was person as well Paul on the other hand lost his life mm -hmm. so Job got blessing but Paul it would look like he didn't get blessing but indirectly, we're reading about Paul today um, a lot of things about Christianity is from the message of Paul and as much as we look at it and say Paul died but his word, Paul has lived past his life. He's still living in our lives today. So we're listening to Paul's message and we're saying, oh, Paul, an apostle of Christ. He did not come in his own strength, but he came in the authority of Christ. And in summary to, it's not the summary of the whole thing. In summary, we would say, it's important that we recognize our giants the example of David and the empowerment through Christ, God's assurance and the victory he got was true faith. You know, so I'll challenge us to always look at David. I'll challenge us to always look at Saul. I'll challenge us Paul. I'll challenge us to always look at Abraham. These are people who had unwavering faith in God. There was nothing that could move their faith in God, you know. And Let's quickly open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 8 and we'll read from verse 1, from verse 1. Matthew chapter 8, please, from verse 1. He says, when he had come down, this is a history of Jesus Christ, he says, when he had come down from the mountain, 
great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you will make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Let's pause for there. Um, in this instance, we, that was Jesus Christ performed a miracle. He's been performing a miracle anyway, but up until now, this leprous man went to him and said, if you are willing, and this is back to what we just said earlier on, irrespective of whether he does it or not, I know you are, if you are willing, it's not whether I want you to do it, but if you are willing, Lord, then I will be cleaned, cleansed. And Jesus Christ said, he is willing to stand up, your leprosy is gone, his leprosy is gone. Let's continue reading. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way. Show yourself to the priest and offer the gifts that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Um, hold, please. I will, I will come and heal him. That's in um, paraphrased, or that's that's in quotation. There's other verse, there are other verses of the Bible that says where it looked like Jesus was asking a question, saying, "Should I come to your house and heal him?" But let's pause again and look. Let's go back and ask ourselves: Jesus Christ was a Jew. The centurion was a Roman. In those days, the Romans were the most hated people. They are the people who call ungodly people. They are people who do not know nothing about God. They don't have a relationship with God. But this centurion came to Jesus Christ and was asking for help. I can imagine Jesus Christ's disciples saying to him, um, yeah, your, so your, servant is, your servant is ill, leprous. That's good. The problem is saying, yeah, we need, we need this kind of people, so it's good. Let the left was secured, kill your servant. I hope you catch it as well. I hope your whole, because centurions, they are in charge of a hundred men, so I hope you catch the leprosy. I hope all your hundred um, soldiers catch the leprosy and die as well with the leprosy, so it's good. But Jesus Christ is asking him, should we come and heal him? Or I will come and heal him, saying, in this version of the reading, it says, I will come and heal him. His disciples are probably looking at him saying, you know, we don't, we don't do those kind of things here. You already have issues with the Pharisees, you have issues with the Jews, you know, healing and, um, what's the word, performing miracles, healing people on the Sabbath day. And now you're saying you want to go to the centurion's house. Jesus, this, is, this should not be happening. Let's continue reading, please. Then the centurion answered and said, Lord, not, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servants will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say this one, go, and he goes. And I say to another, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. You imagine, this is the first time, I think, from what I've read, that Jesus Christ was surprised at someone's faith. He was amazed, he was surprised, he was like, I've never seen this kind of faith. You imagine the, his disciples, how would they feel? Because on one side they're like, yeah, we don't we don't deal with centurions, we don't deal with Romans. They are the bad men, they are the bad people in our gener in our lifetime. They are not people we need to associate with. But Jesus Christ is now saying to them that you do not have if only you could be like this centurion, you know. And the centurion did this. He did this just on the mere fact that. He understood what authority is. He said to himself, I can take to one man, go, and he goes. 
he was not on his own authority, he was under the authority of Rome. He was under the authority of Rome and he understood. Remember, Jesus Christ spoke to a leprous man and said, be cleansed and be clean. So he must have heard that. Remember where we started from. If you hear people's testimony, you hear what God has done in someone's life, you can tap into it. So the centurion probably has heard that Jesus Christ has spoken to sicknesses and sickness and told them, told people to be healed. He's spoken to a blind man, told the blind man, you receive your sight, you receive the sight. So he said to himself, I walk under the authority of Rome. I'm not doing it because I am anything special. I'm just one man, you know. I'm just one man, but I'm under the authority of Rome and I can control, I have control over a hundred soldiers. So Jesus Christ can speak to sicknesses and sicknesses obey him. Yeah. Then he's under the authority and he did not even care what authority Jesus Christ had because he did not have a covenant with God at that time. He was saying to um, himself, he must have had this thing in his mind. I don't care what authority you have, but when you speak to sicknesses, they do move, they obey you. And that's because you have authority of something that is bigger than you, you know? So, and Jesus Christ was marveled. He said to himself, I've never seen such great faith, you know, uh, in Israel, in the whole of Israel. Can you imagine? He did not just say, since I've been born, he just said, since in the whole of Israel. Let's continue reading, please. And I say to you, that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and you would believe as you have believed. So let it be done to you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Remember we did say God is an expert in repeated performances. One time Jesus was physically there to say to the leper, be cleansed. He spoke the word and he was cleansed. In this second time he did it by, he did it wirelessly, like someone would say. It was wireless, wireless information, healing basically. He spoke and the centurion did not even have to go to meet his servant. His servant was healed immediately. We also see a situation where Jesus Christ left the disciples, where his apostles, their shadows was healing people who were sick. So that's where we know that God, if God has done it before, all we need to do is find out when he's done it, and then he will do it again, even in a better, better way. Um, so, like we said, the title was basically um, Ways, the things God uses to grow our faith over fears of giants. So, let us um, quickly... So one of the ways God would increase our faith is by practical teaching. So it's important that every word we hear from this pulpit from the man of God is important that we practice it. It is not, there's a part in the Bible that says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's also a part in the Bible that says faith without work is dead. It is important that we walk this faith. It is important that when we hear, we do. Um, Matthew chapter 5 basically provides, from Matthew chapter 5 verse 7, provide, provides us physical, practical examples for living our faith. You know? James chapter 1, let's take a look at James chapter 1 verse 2, 22. James chapter 1 verse 22. It says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So that verse simply is telling us that when we hear the word and we do not do it, we are deceiving ourselves. Yeah. Um, 
one of my grandparents used to say, a man can deceive others, but deceiving yourself is the worst thing you can do for oneself. So it's important that we not be just hearers, but be doers of the word we hear. Another way God uses to build our faith and increase our faith is by private disciplines. You know, private disciplines are spiritual practices like prayer, Bible reading, and meditation. So we need to cultivate a habit of deeper relationship with God. Um, let's quickly look at our Bibles just to get, to get an example from Luke chapter 5, verse 16. Luke 5, verse 16. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. This is Jesus Christ himself. If Jesus Christ would withdraw and pray in the wilderness by himself, how much more us who are trying to be like him? Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He was God in human flesh. If he could withdraw and pray, it means we need to, we need to do more. He knows there was no reason. Jesus Christ did not need to fast and pray to get things done. But if he was showing us an example, of practical example of how to grow our faith. And so I'll say to us, our brothers and sisters, it's important that we discipline ourselves personally. In our prayer life, we need to improve in our prayer life. We need to improve in our meditation of God's word, according to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. You know, um, let's. Um, another way God uses to improve our faith is our personal ministry. I have it here that our personal ministry is examples of personal ministry will be serving others or allowing others to experience God's love through our actions. And also, this will reinforce our faith in God. It will also reinforce faith of others in God. When we serve people, for instance, someone who doesn't have, doesn't know where they're going to get their next meal from, we go and bless them. That's service. That is service in God. And I thank God for Transformation Sanctuary. We actually do service. We go out and help the poor. We go out and clothe people that are homeless. We go out and give to food banks. We go out and help Great Ormond Hospital. That is service. And I've been to a few of our evangelism, because our outreach programs, and I've seen joy in people's face. When you, a part of the Bible says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was Without clothes, you gave me clothes. When I was in need, you gave to me. That is the testimony. You know, they don't have to physically come and say to you, oh, thank you, God bless you. If they do, God bless us and God bless his name. But if they don't, God still blesses you. God is happy. And it also gives you a chance to say, thank you, Lord, for what you have given to us. Because we look at faith and we think, Faith is only about receiving, 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 but no. Faith is also about, it's just relationship. Everything about the Old Testament was about God telling the children of Israel, have faith in me, have faith in me. The situation of Jesus, of God delivering them from um, Egypt was all about a faith walk. The situation of David delivered from Goliath was all about improving David's faith. The situation of Jesus Christ coming to die for us was all about God renewing faith in man and himself, making people know that I am still here, I am your God, and I love you, and I want to have good relationship with you, you know? That was why Jesus Christ came to die for, for us. It's all about a relationship work, you know? We would not. Everything that makes us happy about our children is knowing that, you know, our children trust us. They trust us for the best things. 
we are happy when we go to work and they say, oh, I trust that you get that done. So how much more God? And the only thing that gets God moving is our faith. The only thing that makes God jump up and down is our faith. Remember, we just read about the centurion. Jesus Christ was amazed. He didn't say, I'm amazed because this guy obeyed the Ten Commandments, or I'm amazed because, like, they could not, like, the rich man that went to him and says, how can I enter the kingdom of God? And sell God, obey all the commandments, and he said, I've done it all. Jesus Christ was not amazed <laughs> by that. He was amazed, basically, at the man's faith in him. And it's important, we do not know how underestimated we make our faith look because and the devil knows this the devil knows that if we have faith in God we will move mountains Jesus said if you have just little faith as a mustard seed you will say to a mountain be moved and the mountain will be moved so it is important that we grow our faith it is important that we know where we stand in Christ um, I'm running out of time quickly. I do not know I'll be running out of time. Uh, I'm not fourthly. Did I say personal ministry was the last one? Yeah. And four, number four, providential relationship. And here I've written down that God places people in our lives to provide support. He places people in our lives to challenge us. He places people in our lives to encourage us in our faith journey. All these are providential relationships. It's not just people in places in our lives, it places situations in our lives to do all these three things that I've mentioned. You know, I'll give an example. Someone might be ill, and God would use that illness to build their faith. When He, when he heals them, their faith is built up. So in tomorrow, if they have some sort of illness, and they'll look back and say, oh, the God who healed me yesterday is able to do this again for me today, you know. Um, let's open our Bibles quickly to 1 Samuel chapter 18. So that's an example of providential relationship. 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 20. Sorry, first Samuel, first Samuel chapter 18 to 20 is basically about, sorry, sorry about that, because we don't have time to start reading. So first Samuel chapter 18 to 20 is basically the relationship of Jonathan and David. You know, Jonathan was there to support David all through, even against his father. He, he was just there to support David when David was giving up, when David was feeling like he was feeling down and it was like nothing. God has said concerning me will come to pass. Jonathan was there to basically beef up David's faith and basically lead, give him support to say, you know what, irrespective of what my father would say or what my father's people would think, you are God's chosen one, you know. And let's quickly open our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 27 and we'll read verse 17. Proverbs 27 verse 17. Something about iron sharpening iron. It says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. That was an example, a perfect example of what David did with Jonathan did for David. He just basically sharpened it. And it's important that we watch the relationships we keep. We watch the people we hang around. Um, lead to young, uh, young men and women here. It's important that we watch the relationship, the people we hang around, the people we get involved with, the people we basically go and call our best friends. I work in prison and a lot of them are in prison today, not because they have committed the crime themselves, but just because they are in the wrong relationships. They say, People are guilty by association, by law. Just guilty by association. So you just, if you have ungodly association, it's important that we cut ourselves from such association. And God will give us the grace and the power to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. And lastly, 
one of the ways God uses to build our faith is by high hotel circumstances. Life, significant life events can lead us to spiritual growth and re re-evaluation of our faith. Prompting, prompting deeper relationship or reliance on God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 4. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 4. Please. It says, and not only that, but we also grow in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which was given to us. For we, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let's leave it there. So it is important, very important, that we know that even in tough times, God is there for us. It is very important. So in conclusion, I'll say, that our practical teachings, our private disciplines, our personal ministry, our potential relationship, and the Bible to circumstances, we use all serve as tools that God uses to cultivate our strength and strengthen our faith, helping us grow in our relationship with Him. And that will be the end of the sermon. So let us just pray.